thank you all for joining us um, this evening or this afternoon or um, possibly even this morning, depending where in the world you are. Um, it's a huge pleasure um, today to welcome Derek Hook to Lacan in Scotland. Um, Derek is no stranger to Lacan in Scotland. He's presented with us before um, in person um, in Edinburgh, um, but it's great to have him here today um, all the way from Pittsburgh. Um, especially a privilege for us given Derek's newfound fame as a YouTube influencer, um, soaring into the heights of um, YouTube fame as, as one of the, um, the most well-watched Lacanians on YouTube. So um, if you're not already caught up with Derek's YouTube channel, um, there should be a link in the chat and you can follow him there and you'll be able to watch um, today back again on his YouTube channel as well. Also, even see yourself if you ask a question at the end. Um, Derek is an associate professor in Pittsburgh. He's a prolific author on Lacan um, and as well as Lacanian theory, um, kind of straight theory, neat theory. He also writes a lot on um, Lacan, applying Lacan to, to questions of race and, and culture more generally. He's also one of the editors of the Reading Lacan's Decree series. So um, I imagine you know many of many of you know him from that as well. So without further ado, I'm going to open the um, the floor up to Derek, and he's going to be talking to us tonight about Lacan's one of Lacan's earlier decree, um, function and field. Um, Derek will talk for about 45 minutes, um, after which we'll open things up to questions and we'll have a, about another 45 minutes um, of discussion. Okay, Derek, over to you. Great, thank you, Callum, <clears throat> and thanks everyone for uh, joining us today. Um, it's a little bit of an impossible task to speak cogently and coherently about a very dense and important ecri um, within uh, Lacan's ecri. So what I'm gonna try and do is just highlight a couple of ideas, give a few comments by way of context, um, and then basically try and challenge us with a series of exercises in Lacanian thinking. Um, and then hopefully I can keep it to 45 minutes and then it'll be good to get people's contributions so we could try to articulate some of these ideas and develop them a little bit more. Um, many of you will already know something about the context of function and field, but in case you don't, I'll just give one or two points. One is to say that it's an extraordinary document, partly because of how compressed it is. Um, it contains uh, an unbelievable density of ideas. And in many respects, you can rightly say that it's a, it's a blueprint of a decade's worth of teaching that Lacan will go on to pursue. It's also worth noting that uh, function and field is very much, uh, very much marks the dividing line between uh, the great many publications and writings that Lacan had produced up until that point, both within psychiatry and within psychoanalysis, um, and then what you could call his mature teachings. So he delivers the verbal presentation of function and field, in other words, the celebrated Rome discourse in uh, September uh, 1953, and two months later, he begins seminar one. So you, you, you get that sense, and also this idea, uh, which Jacqueline Millet has emphasized, that this is where his teaching actually begins. So it's kind of a, a crucial uh, landmark in Lacanian theory. Um, another piece of historical information, there was a split in the Société Psychoanalyque de Paris, sorry about that, I'm embarrassed even for trying to pronounce it, um, the Paris Society for short, uh, which occurs around 53, when Daniel Lagache and Lacan and others end up forming a new society, uh, the Société Française de Psychoanalyse. And what that then meant was that although Lacan had been scheduled to be a key speaker at the biannual Congress of French Speaking Psychoanalysis in 1953, he wasn't able to formally take up that role and so ended up doing a kind of extemporized version of his paper at a, in, in a slightly different um, forum. The other point to make is that reading through the paper, one realizes uh, how powerfully um, antagonistic Lacan was to the prevailing orthodoxy of a kind of neurological, biological approach in, in, in psychoanalysis at the time, um, certainly as exemplified by colleagues such as Sacha Nacht and others um, in French psychoanalysis at that time. And of course, uh, this is a comment Paul Vahagi has also made. When you bear that in mind, you see how this paper is still of fundamental significance for us today. 
So one last point I'll note is that um, in Elizabeth Rudinesco's biography of Lacan, she says that in 1953, in the summer, Lacan had just married uh, Sylvia, who had been Sylvia Bataille, and he spent a large part of that summer finishing up the 500 pages of the Rome Discourse. Um, she says, conscious of the importance of his own teaching and anxious to occupy first place in the new society founded by Lagash, he set up looking about for support in what he took to be unlikely places, psychiatric circles, the Communist Party, and the Catholic Church. In fact, this is kind of a slightly comedic note. Um, Lacan was also seeking an audience with the Pope. And you get a sense then both that the cultural standing of psychoanalysis at the time must have been something different to what it is today, but also that Lacan was in no way lacking in ambition um, with what he had hoped to achieve with this document. So with all those uh, contextualized uh, moments in place, let's, um, let's begin. We're gonna try and, as I mentioned, uh, reference a couple of key ideas. And the first idea that I would like to draw attention to, and just to say, these ideas are hopefully going to walk a, a bit of a, a line, will balance between being introductory for those people who are coming to these ideas relatively afresh, and will hopefully also open up a little bit to people who've got um, a good deal more of experience in Lacan. So idea number one is what I'm calling the speaker as a form of intersubjectivity. There was something fortuitous about this idea because a couple of weeks ago, I was asked to review a, review a paper uh, for the journal Psychoanalysis and History. And it's a great piece of work by a guy called Alexander Miller, who's at New York University. And in that paper, he, he talks about a key moments in function and field, and he relates it back to the theories of, and the writings of Emile Benveniste, the, the um, I think he's Italian linguist. So here's the quote from Alexander Miller. Lacan stressed that the speaking subject's act of allocation, that is of addressing themselves to another in speech, necessarily brings with it an addressee. The implication being that in the act of speech, the speaker does not simply enter into a relationship of intersubjectivity, but more strongly is constituted as intersubjectivity. To say that the speaker is constituted as intersubjectivity is to attest to a redoubling division of the subject implicit in the very act of speech. Hence, we have the idea that it's not simply that the speaker is involved in a form of intersubjectivity, but the speaker is themselves a form of intersubjectivity. Now, Miller does a very nice job of pinpointing some of those same ideas in uh, Benveniste's work. And he talks about Benveniste's grammatical categories um, and analysis, which shows the co-presence of an I and a you, or better yet, the I-U relation, not simply within an empirical two-body situation, but at the very source of every utterance or every act of enunciation. And I'm quoting from Miller, his analysis of this relation establishes the irreducibility of intersubjectivity, or more generally, the relationship to the other at the origin of speech, and does so as a formal feature of language alone, relying neither on a phenomenology of consciousness, nor of a developmental narrative to do so. Now, of course, this is not necessarily a new idea to Lacanians, but it's one I want to stress here for a bunch of reasons. Number one, it's usefully counterintuitive in as much as it runs against the grain of many commonplace psychological and phenomenological conceptualizations of what intersubjectivity is. Secondly, it shows us how a linguistic, as opposed to a phenomenological or psycho a psychological analysis, yields something crucial about psychical function. Um, and I think also, thirdly, it helps us think clinically about how we should position ourselves as analysts, how we should position ourselves clinically, not simply as a partner in dialogue of the analysand, but as an operator of sorts who registers facets of that person's intersubjectivity. Now, eventually Lacan will in turn move away from something of this idea. He will develop it so it's not merely a subject-object relation reduplicated within each act of speaking, Though something of the residue of that idea remains, and as I've said, I think it's a clinically useful, um, intellectually useful idea, but what it ends up becoming is something more like that in each act of speaking, we have the subject 
big other dialectic. The subject big other dialectic or interchange. And once we have that foundational piece in place, we're just one step away from one of the notions of the unconscious that is um, addressed and developed within function and field. And that is the idea that the unconscious could be thought of as the discourse of the other. Okay, so that's our first, first idea. A second idea is just a snippet that comes up later on in function and field. And that is simply to say that Lacan, of course, is interested in linguistics. He's also interested in theories of communication, but he can barely contain himself from you know, uh, offering multiple critiques every time he draws on some source material. So one of his critiques about typical theories of communication is that such theories tend to neglect how the subject is involved in the language exchange. This, he says, is a serious omission, and I quote him, for the function of language in speech is not simply to inform, but to evoke. And I suppose we could put it this way. Many theories of language are interested in information about the content of what is conveyed. Lacan is interested in how the addressee function is activated, and also, of course, how there is a kind of evocation, even a provocation within the speech act. We could say then, it is by looking to response from the other that one constitutes one's own answers and identifications. What constitutes me as a subject is my question. In other words, I'm trying to build on our first assertion. Not only is a subject, a speaking subject, an instance of intersubjectivity, firstly. Secondly, the subject is an instance of the subject's big other dialectic. And thirdly, once that dialectic relationship to the other is in place, that subject is always going to be, in a way, minimally hystericized, emptied out, made desiring, made lacking, uh, defined by their emptiness, defined by a question. So that's our second idea, how the subject is constantly emptied out by virtue of being engaged with the other, by virtue of uh, speaking themselves within the symbolic domain, the emptying, the lacking of the subject. And um, as we go on, I suppose I'm going to end up highlighting those ideas I found most challenging. And one of those is also this contraction where Lacan talks about manek être, again, sorry for butchering French, but <clears throat> subject as lack, the lacking subject, the, the lack that is the subject. Let's now move on to our third idea. And I was trying to be a little bit witty with this, probably didn't work out so well, but um, in the conference, not in the paper abstract, I'd mentioned what does it mean to think about Pascal as a reader of The Prisoner's Dilemma? And um, what I'm pointing to here is what we could call the factor of realization for Lacan, the realization of the subject, which is an interesting but loaded concept that he doesn't fully flesh out within function and field, or we could also think about what Lacan has in mind by the notion of the historicity of the subject. And what I'm essentially getting at here is the crucial factor of a type of precipitate, precipitate, precipitative temporality in the subject. But let's go back to Pascal as reader of The Prisoner's Dilemma. That'll be our in to this theme. One of the features which is quite striking about function and field is just how often Lacan refers back to his logical time paper. This is significant because as we've already said, up until function and field, all of those papers are consigned to by Lacan as his antecedents. But nevertheless, the logical time paper is perhaps the one that he references the most of the earlier work. Uh, much more so, I, I'm not even sure he does reference the mirror stage. Um, so why is this logical time paper so crucial for him? Now, many of us are familiar with the, the central riddle, the, the, the sophism, the dilemma in, in, in logical time. So I won't replay that now, but we could briefly note what's important about it. And in fact, Dominic Holmes is here. Maybe he'll tell us later. Anyways, what are we dealing with with the prisoner's dilemma? One way of approaching, approaching the prisoner's dilemma and, and the key uh, challenge of logical time is that we're given there an example of an anticipatory or preemptive act on behalf of a subject, which is also determinative for the subject themselves. So let's just keep that in mind. Somehow there's an anticipatory or preemptive act or action, which despite being anticipatory, preemptive, anticipatory, precipitative, is also somehow determinative for the subject themselves. Okay, key theme in that paper. 
So what we have then is a nice example of philosophical wit where Lacan notes that Pascal's famous wager about the existence of God can be read in conjunction with his logical time paper. In other words, we all familiar with Pascal's famous wager, even if I do not believe in God, it makes a lot of sense to pronounce myself a believer, to act as if I do believe in God, because if I do so, only a finite loss will be incurred of the fact that God does not in exist, whereas there'll be infinite gains if he does, and I am a believer. So I kind of like this uh, crisscrossing of uh, uh, logical time and, and Pascal. But let's note a couple of points in respect of this um, cross-referencing that we see happening in, in, in Lacan. The first we could say of the points to be made here concerns the role of the precipitous subjective gesture, the role of identifications and desires having this uh, precipitous anticipatory dimension runs very much counter to sequential stage theories of development and related notions of maturational periods, which we start to see in ego psychology and in post-Freudian psychoanalysis of the time. Um, I hadn't set out to do this when starting to write up the paper, but I suppose what I'm doing here is doing a lot of work where I'm trying to show how Lacanian notions disrupt and overtly challenge um, commonplace notions within psychology. So that's one idea. A second moment here that's crucial to bear in mind is that I think Lacan is doing something original and important in terms of subjectivization. We could say that there are certain truth effects, certain subject effects within the clinical arena, which are crude to such a precipitous mode of temporality. Put differently, there are some truths which are only truths due to the fact that they were anticipated, that they were preempted by a subjective act of wagering. It's worthwhile stressing here that this point that I'm making about futurity, about anticipation, about an act whereby the subject both anticipates and has a determinative influence on themselves is also very much a point about speech. Lacan wants to stress throughout the paper the importance, obviously, of language and speech. And he also wants to stress that speech is what allows the subject to situate themselves relative to the future. And while we're thinking about this dimension of futurity, it's worth noting the notion of full speech. Um, I've developed this a, a ex fairly extensively elsewhere, so I won't go into it in great detail now. But let me just note that we often think about full speech as a speech before the other, which occurs via the other, of a speech which is disruptive of the ego in a way which brings with it a kind of unconscious truth possibility or an unconscious truth event. But what I started to realize in reading through the paper again is that full speech is also precipitous, preemptive speech, speech which in a sense runs ahead of the subject. And if we had to make brief reference to one of the, the definitions or descriptions that, that Lacan offers of uh, full speech, we hear that truth is the event of full speech, he writes, in which the patient reorders past contingencies by conferring on them the sense of necessities to come. In other words, to facilitate full speech as a clinician is not only to punctuate the otherness of speech, to punctuate the materiality of the speech as it unfolds, whereby the subject says more than they realize that they are saying. To facilitate full speech is also to punctuate the subject's prospective assumption of different futures. It doesn't take a genius to work out that there's an obvious Heideggerian influence here in this dimension of an unfolding uh, relationship to the future. But I think this is also the time to emphasize one of my favorite quotes from within the, the paper, um, where Lacan does start to speak more about, in explicit terms, the historicity of the subject. Here it is. What is realized in my history is neither the past definite as what was, since it is no more, nor even is it the past perfect of what has been and what I am, but the future anterior as what I will have been, given that I'm now in the process of becoming. A little bit of a mouthful, but we could try to parse that out by saying a couple of things. We could say that speaking in a context like that of clinical psychoanalysis, a context where the dimension of the other is consistently stressed within my speech, means that I'm forced to realize myself as something other than the ego that I suppose I am. 
this realization of the subject, this suggestive phrase that Lacan uses again and again, this realization of the subject, which entails the grasping of a shifting otherness to their subjectivity that exceeds their ego sense of itself. This pertains to different times of the subject. In other words, you could say that one prospective aim or agenda of psychoanalysis is to affect the temporality of the subject and the temporality of the subject as he or she is located both in the past, the present, and the future. We could suggest that one of the aims here is thus to disrupt the egoic imaginary relationship to the past, definite, as we saw in Lacan's quote, the present as representing the continuity of certain facets of the past into the present, and also the future. You could say that all of those modes of disruption would potentially be beneficial analytically. But I think we would be missing Lacan's point if we didn't stress that it's that dimension of the future perfect, or is often referred to in the Lacanian literature, the future anterior, that, that Lacan wants to privilege in psychoanalytic work. And it's the future perfect, the future anterior, is that tense in which one looks towards a future event, which is nonetheless punctuated by a definitive endpoint. Maybe that's the end of analysis. Maybe that's the end of one's life. The disruptive effects of otherness on the ego mean that the subject here is invited to assume the contingencies of what I will have been, I will have been, which implies that definitive endpoint, while simultaneously assuming the potential futurity of being in the process of becoming. So there's an interesting mode of temporality, which implies both that we rush forward to the end, this reminds one of um, Heidegger's rushing into death, um, an endpoint which will come, but also the fact that simultaneous to that temporality, there's the potential futurity of me being in the process of becoming. And we could spend a lot of time just trying to figure out all of the implications of that. But I like uh, John Forrester's brief comment. He says, this might be likened to an unwriting of the future. And, um, and I suppose the reason I wanted to mention it is just to think and to emphasize again, let resonate this idea that such a precipitate temporality is crucial to Lacanian technique, to the realization of the subject, which is not an ego. And I think Lacan brings this issue, the subjectivization of the future to psychoanalysis in a way that no one had done quite like that before. And just to reiterate that point as well, the clinic should thus have an intervention at different modes of the subject's temporality. There's a nice comment that um, I think his name is Samuel Weber, uh, Lacan scholar, offers here. He says, in invoking the future anterior, Lacan troubles the perfected closure of the always already having been by inscribing it in the inconclusive futurity of what will always already having been. <laughs> it is irreducible, this is Weber, it is an irreducible remainder or remnant that will continually prevent the subject from ever becoming entirely self-identical. So let's move on now, <clears throat> having emphasized this dimension, um, the originality of this dimension, of the realization of the subject, of the future anterior. Um, let's move on now to the notion that I think is also really crucial in function and field. And that is that law is in some respects language. Uh, law in some respects is language. So in the second part of function and field, Lacan develops a distinctive psychoanalytic account of why law is always underpinned by language. The law of man, he says, effectively is always the law of language. He does some interesting references here to a whole series of anthropological sources. And one of the places he begins in thinking about law as being instantiated within language is uh, the work of Maurice Leonhardt. And Leonhardt has this idea that for certain cultures, uh, particularly he has in mind the Pacific Argonauts, gifts, and here I quote, gifts, the act of giving them and the objects given, their transmutation into signs and even their fabrication were all closely intertwined with speech. So that's, that's Lacan. So what we're talking about here is a conjunction of a series of ideas, gifts, exchange, symbolization. Gifts, symbolization, exchange, and ultimately law. So let's see if we can open that up again, take it step by step. We could say then that what's important to realize and register here is the primacy of gift giving 
in certain cultures, presumably all human cultures, and what that does, the process of gift giving in the making of a symbolic bond. Now, because I've been talking about anticipatory temporality, I'm going to do a little stealing of a quote from the future. And um, Paul Verhaag, in his own commentary on function and field, makes a nice, concise formulation, which I will try to develop a little bit more. But this is what he says. Based on Levi-Strauss and Marcel Mauss, Lacan suggests that language means exchange and that exchange means law in the most fundamental meaning of that word. What is given is less important than the process of exchange itself because the fact of giving and receiving determines a recognition. Every one of us functions within a symbolically determined system of exchanges that determines every possible relationship. And this occurs even before someone opens his or her mouth. Language imposes a symbolically determined system of exchange in a structure of kinship in which every individual speaker is assigned his or her position. This never ending exchange has to do with a fundamental debt. The symbol is the murder of the thing. Okay, so that's the end of that quote. We'll, we'll try and develop that a little bit, but clearly we're hearing a lot about exchange, but we're also getting a sense here about how the symbolic order is in some respects built up, perpetuated, um, performed, enacted via forms of exchange, which bring with them a question of a debt. And this question of a debt, I suppose, implies once again, the dimension of the future, but it also implies some agency, some movement, within the system, some debt, some owing of the subject. So let's go back and talk a little bit more about law. One of my own personal uh, projects, I think, in trying to deal with early Lacan is to get the sense of the profound interconnection of law and language and how the symbolic operates. And this, I think, is so crucial because often in shorthand uses of Lacanian we see symbolic all being equated with the contents of a language or a culture. And of course, you can see how that happens because, you know, there's this famous notion, Lacan says, the some, uh, symbolic is the treasury of the signifier or the big other is the treasury of the signifier. But of course, the crucial element there, it's the treasury of the signifier, not of signifies. But nonetheless, I think it's a, it's a kind of routine error um, that we often think of or people utilize the symbolic order as a kind of collection, a collection of signifiers. And here's where I think Levi-Strauss and his reference to the stomach, which I love, is so important. Why do I say that? The symbolic order is not equivalent to what is socially constructed. The symbolic order is a type of operating system which is essentially contentless. It has no essential subject matter. It possesses no materials. And the same is true of the unconscious approached via Levi-Strauss's instructive suggestion that the unconscious is always empty. It is as much a stranger to the images that pass through it as the stomach is to the food which passes through it. This contentless nature of the symbolic order is nicely stressed by Muller and Richardson, and they're not here today, but I brought their book along, who likewise call attention to how the operation of the symbolic order encompasses more than language in its verbal and written forms. This is their little summary of one of these points, which I think is helpful. The symbolic order, they say, conceived as law, governs not only the order of language, but the logic of mathematical combination, and indeed the whole pattern of social relatedness that emerges under the guise of marriage ties, kinship relationships, forms of exchange, superimposing the kingdom of culture on that of nature. Okay, end of the quote. In other words, the symbolic order produces a range of structuring laws by virtue of how it works, which is precisely on the basis of a combinatorial logic. And there's multiple different combinatorial logics, but of course, within language, grammar would be the most obvious one. And also crucially um, for, for Lacan and various other linguists, metaphor and metonymy. This is one of those moments in function and field where Lacan is saying something that will emerge again, in this case, 11 years later in seminar 11, which is not here either, but the book is here, where Lacan will still take up this point emphasizing that the priority for psychoanalysis lies with, and here I quote him, the combinatorial operation functioning spontaneously in a pre-subjective way. It is this linguistic structure that gives its status to the unconscious. 
Okay, so there we're getting a different view um, and quite a profound view of how the operations of language, I mean, this is basic structuralism really, but how the operations of language bring with them a kind of law. Back though to Lacan's engagement with anthropology and with Maurice Leonhardt. Lacan asks us, is it with these gifts or with the passwords that sometimes come with gifts that give them their salutary non-meaning? Is it thus that language begins along with the law? Is it, in other words, by means of gift giving, the capacity to abstract things from their primary use value, that properly symbolic and law instantiating behaviors, and more importantly yet language, really begin? So we've said a lot, which seems to suggest that the answer is maybe a tentative yes, because exchanges inform, hold in place, uh, enact the symbolic order at some level. And as Lacan will emphasize, gifts seem always ready to function as kind of rudimentary symbols, as, as almost uh, parasymbolic in a sense. And we know this because symbolic value clearly outweighs practical value. Gifts that are given are often uh, functionally useless, but have an important signification. So bearing in mind, this is Lacan of the 50s, we are led to a conclusion that there is a certain neutralization by means of the signifier. Pacification might be a better word here. That is, there is the establishment of pacts, laws, and social relations made possible by symbolization. Is this the underlying basis of language itself? This seems to be the underlying basis of certain symbolic operations, and it's clearly crucial, but this is not the underlying basis of language itself. And it is at this point, I mean, maybe what I've said sounds a little rudimentary, a little bit introductory in terms of Lacanian basic theory, but here's where things get a little bit more challenging. It's not simply enough to have a system of exchanges and the rudimentary symbolization that goes along with those exchanges to be the basis of human language. Why? Well, Lacan gives one of his odd ethological observations here. He says, some of you will be familiar with the example, sea swallows pass fish to one another from beak to beak. This seems to be some kind of exchange, but it's gonna always fall short of, of language. Why is that? Well, we can already guess and say that given that Lacan is so informed and inspired by uh, structural linguistics, we know that language involves a differential system of signifiers. So we know that, but let's go through Lacan's reasoning here. Are those capable of symbolism? No, says Lacan. There's something else that completes the symbol that makes language of it. Paul Vahagi makes a very nice comment here. He says that in many moments in function and field, it would be more accurate to translate what Lacan is calling a symbol as a signifier. So if we were to do that, we would, and I'm just rolling back a few seconds. No, says Lacan, there's something else that completes the signifier, making language of it. What then is it that makes a prospective signifier, be it an object of exchange or a gift, effective as a unit of language? It's not simply the fact that we're dealing with sound, the materiality of the signifier with verbal exclamations. It's not that alone, that's important. What effectively makes a signifier operate in a properly linguistic manner is not simply the fact that it's become disconnected from any immediate relationship to the signified. Okay, that's like like on 101, we got that. Signifiers don't fundamentally refer to signifiers, they refer to other signifiers, and the effect of that is to, to give us a signified. But there's some other level to Lacan's reasoning here. The signifying element of the signifier has to signify the very disconnection from the signified. It has to instantiate an absence. And this is the theme that kind of made me a little bit anxious, but excited. A signifier needs to instantiate an absence. The word says Lacan is a presence made absence. Okay, and the word is a presence made absence. What does this mean? <sighs> It means that a signifier doesn't just become disconnected from the signified in the way that, uh, that structural linguistics had suggested. The signifier somehow needs to mark the very fact of its disconnection. What does Lacan do now? He's got this little formula. We have a signifier as the presence made absence and he does the thing that he does uh, and he turns to Freud and he turns to the famous thought da game. 
Now, we all remember this. There's a little child who in a series of acts, which joins signifiers and actions, throws away a little cotton reel, says, fort, gone, before retrieving it, uttering the word, dog, there. In this way, the child not only symbolizes the comings and goings of the mother, says Lacan, but also symbolizes the very fact of symbolization itself. In this way, here's a quote from Lacan, from this articulated couple of presence and absence, language's world of meaning is born. Right, so it's, it's often around here that headaches start to emerge. So I don't know if you've got a headache yet, but don't worry. Uh, we'll make your headache worse. So one little call out to the future is the far later subsequent Lacanian notion of the unary trace. And um, without going into that too much, you could try to pass it as this idea that there are moments in the symbolic uh, life of human culture where one is involved in the act of making a marking, a marking, a mark on the wall. The mark on the wall is not necessarily representational, rather it's a manifestation of its own artificiality. So let's just keep that in mind. Again, sounds a little bit abstract. We'll try and develop that. When we think about the unary trace or part of what Lacan seems to be articulating here. And for me, this is something I don't see elsewhere in other social theories. I think it's, it's very much a, a, a Lacanian emphasis. We're talking about a theory of signifierness. The unary trace, the ma making of a mark is sometimes not representational. It's about the marking which manifests an art, the realm of artificiality, the symbolic mark which differentiates itself from the world of objects and also the world of representational links to the world of objects. We're gonna give a couple of examples of this <clears throat> and we're gonna talk briefly about Chinese writing. Having taken us into a moment of theory which he doesn't seem to have properly clarified, Lacan, in a characteristic move, makes things more complicated rather than less. And his arguments concerning the vacillation of absence and presence in the making of language, still being somewhat unclear, he now throws another example, citing the Koomantics of China, by which I think he's referring to the origins of Chinese writing. And I don't know if any of this is correct, actually. I, I, I'm very much indebted to Mark de Kessel, who has formulated some of these ideas. Let's... Um, <clears throat> Let's see if we can, now that I've thrown poor Mark under the bus, let's see if we can make something of it. In speaking of the origin of Chinese writing, and I'm hoping that someone can share that um, uh, on the chat, there's a, a little document which shows up these chromantics of China. We see a series of characters, each of which consists of three bars, which can be distinguished from others according to how their respective bars are broken up. So it's a kind of rudimentary well, rudimentary is not necessarily the right word, but it, it, it's a series of inscriptions, a series of marks, which do not function by virtue of being representational. They are not merely substitutes or replacements for items in the world. And this is evident given that their arrangement in different combination produces meanings rather than any one-to-one -one correspondence with objects. This quality sets these signifiers apart from any objects in the world. This is their signifierness or to go back to the phrase that Lacan was using before, this is their ability to engender an absence by virtue of their presence. They're definitively not what they signify, they engender an absence, and yet they do signify something, they engender a presence, they thus make meaning possible. And we could say it's the very how of this break with reality, the fact of their minimal combinatorial differences, which proves to be the crucial distinguishing element of each such character. What we then start to approach is the idea that language operates as an operational differential system through which almost everything in principle can be signified. There's a finite set of letters or differentiated sounds which can be arranged in an infinite set of ways to produce a non-ending series of significations. And this is what I think we are talking about when or Lacanians are when they talk about signifierness. Now, I just said we get more complicated rather than less. So let's try and do that as a kind of methodological principle. And um, we'll talk about the notion of the zero symbol. This is a concept that is uh, prevalent at the time in, in social anthropology. And Levi Strauss is excited by it. He doesn't come up with it. But what do we mean when we talk about a zero signifier? 
Well, let's just take one step back. Its language, says Lacan, and the symbolic order more generally, particularly insofar as it enables the paternal operations of the name of the father that makes the law, okay? So I'm trying to take one step back and say, this is all part of how Lacan is thinking, how law is imminent, is, is intrinsically inbuilt within language itself. So he's got this nice idea. We've already played on that theme of indebtedness, but now we have an idea that it is the word, the utilization of words, the operation of the symbolic order that implies that that makes the law. And says Lacan, it is the word, drawing on the words of Francois Rabelais, sorry about that, that we pay our great debt, a debt which is inviolable, absolute, priceless. Again, it's a theme I've been trying to reiterate, this idea that in speaking, one becomes lacking. And in here and now, we also get a sense of that in speaking, we become indebted somehow. That debt, if we're going to try and understand the slightly new theme now, this indebtedness of the subject, once they start to utilize the symbolic, that debt is the name of the distance of things as they are in their everyday materiality from signifies. In Polynesian archaic cultures, this distance is incorporated in the sacred how or the omnipresent manner, which for Levi-Strauss indicates the zero symbol, a symbol indicating the symbolic nature of all things constituting a culture. So yes, I also have a headache now, and I've also been trying to understand this, but nevertheless, I'm also getting a headache. So let's, let's try and keep things a little bit more basic. What the hell is manna? What is the hell is a zero symbol? I didn't bring Anthony Wilden here today, but um, actually he might not he'll no longer be with us, but I did bring this book. And this is a pretty much a book length commentary on function and field. And in that text, Wilden gives us a very helpful description of what this notion of manner, what this notion of the zero symbol might be and why it might be useful. Here, I quote from him, concepts like that of manner, devolved from what Levi-Strauss conceives of as an overabundance of the signifier in relationship to actual signifiers, that is, the universe, the cosmos, which are available to human symbolic thought. Let's put a pause there. Are we not then saying simply that one of the oddities of language is that it's able to engender far more signifiers than they are for things in the world? I think that is what we're saying. Let's go back to Wilden. Thus, a concept like manner seeks to fulfill the function of representing all that might be encompassed by this floating signifier. Marcel Mauss's celebrated essay, The Gift, depends upon the notion of how or manner. These are two signifiers that he finds in the course of um, uh, anthropological fieldwork and, and so on and so forth. What are these words? How do they operate in those cultures? He says manner or how act as the raison d'etre of the symbolic exchange. Their prime importance lies in the fact that they enable a certain location, uh, a reference point, we could say. Levi-Strauss seeks to interpret this mysterious anthropological entity in scientific terms as something like an algebraic symbol representing an indeterminate value of signification in the same way as the zero phoneme is one whose function is simply to be opposed to all other phonemes without entailing any phonetic or differential value in itself. It's going to push pause again there. It's almost like manner as it's used within those cultural locations is a purely symbolic, emptied, cleansed signifier with no contents. Um, maybe clever people than me have probably really thought about this or explored it in some ways. Maybe it's a bit like it's equivalent to the, the, the zero function in mathematics. Presumably that's why people refer to it as the zero phoneme, so on and so forth. But it, its function is not to have a, a definitive signification. Back to Wilden's quote, just as the function of the zero phoneme is said to exist in opposition to the absence of phonemes, manner is viewed by Levi-Strauss as a significant significant symbol, empty of meaning in itself, but therefore capable of taking on any meaning required. Last part of the quote, manner is a category of thought rather than a category of actuality. It fulfills for the speaker, the role of explanation that modern science fulfills for us. On this view, like the zero phoneme, manner is pure form without specific content, pure symbol, 
a symbol with the value of zero. Okay, that's the most difficult part of today done with. What else can we say about this idea of the zero signifier? We could say that the notion of the zero signifier points to the function of the non-meaning bearing or purified symbol emptied of all perspective contents or references to the world. You could say that this zero signifier indexes the symbolicity of the signifier, or, and again, I'm trying to build on this theme, it, it indexes the quality of signifierness. Ah. I'm gonna just say one more point about this and then we'll build to our last two themes and I've got an eye on the time. So I've been talking for 45 minutes. So I'll, I'll try and, and try and wrap it up. This is a kind of perplexing concept. How do we utilize it? How does it become useful to us? Because a lot of that sounded to me like almost pure theory. Well, says Mark de Kessel, we're able to consider by virtue of the existence of something like a pure symbol. We're able to consider everything to be subjected to something like this zero symbol. He picks up on a reference in Lacan's text where Lacan talks about uh, the last judgment. And the Kessel says, we're able to consider everything to be subjected to something like this last judgment. The latter can be read as a means of implementing the zero symbol. In other words, it's a signifier marking everything with negativity, with the fact of its disconnection from the physical material actuality of the world. Now, um, de Kessel builds on this. He says, even if one does not acknowledge the cultural or religious idea, such as that of the last judgment, one can nonetheless recognize the function of the zero symbol in what Heidegger would call being towards death. For Heidegger, as we're all familiar, human existence, das sein, is a project inherently oriented to the future. The human being is there having to be. Now, of course, what you may start to see now or feel, I'm hoping it works, is that it's a little bit of overlap of themes. We've been spending a lot of time talking about signifierness, zero signifiers, and how they locate one relative to something, some ultimate, some last judgment, some death, presumably. That is obviously the implication of linking the notion of signifierness and the zero symbol to Heideggerian being unto death. But the link I'm hoping that is now starting to fall into place is that that signifierness, that reference to something like a last judgment, is also pulling into the picture some of the anticipative, precipitate temporality that we really spoke about. <sighs> Heidegger, we've seen, has thus signed the project inherently oriented to the future. As I've said, the human being is there having to be. This means then that their orientation to the future goes hand in hand with their radically finite condition. Lacan then reads this combination of future tense and finitude in a distinctive way, which draws on the inspiration of Levi-Strauss, even as it highlights the role of desire. Finitude is thus realized in the order of the signifier as it denies, as it negates actual material entities. We have here then the notion that the symbolic order implies the death of the things as they are. And we're going to start to move towards a conclusion. There's a whole lot of other stuff we could say about death drive, but I think I'm hoping some of the themes might be coalescing a little bit here. Human existence, realizing itself within the realm of the signifier, is thus also marked by desire. Indeed, human existence is to be considered as the movement of desire. We might put it this way. The subject is the lack of being, searches for who they are, as a result, they invest in a succession of signifiers and thus become caught in an endless process of being deferred from one signifier to another. It is in this sense that human beings live life as desire. Let's recapitulate. Let's try and sum up some of these ideas and then we'll finish with what I kind of hope might be a little bit of a flourish. It helps, I think, in grasping these ideas, both of uh, a kind of precipitate temporality, the future anterior, on the one hand, and notions of signifierness, or as Lacan puts it, the presence made of absence. It helps in grasping these ideas to identify and explore one of the most important philosophical resources that Lacan is drawing on. The key here lies in grasping how Lacan performs a conjunction of Freud and Hegel, or more appropriately, of Freud and Alexander Kojev's reading of Hegel. So we've already seen how Freud for Lacan intuited the interplay of presence and absence within the operation of language in the fourth Dar game. Okay? This is one 
invaluable resource that Lacan will draw on in thinking about how language works and why language, the workings of language are absolutely crucial to psychoanalysis. So we've got that facet in place, but now we need to factor in Hegel and Hegel's account of absence in language. And now I'm gonna draw on um, Jonathan Scott Lee's book on Lacan. He has a great quote. He says, what we need to take into account is the basics of a structuralist account of language, okay? Differential um, elements that work together. He says this, once we've grasped the structuralist account of non, uh, language, we know that what distinguishes mere symbols from words is that while both are material objects, each of my words is an absence as well as a material presence. More specifically, each of my words is what it is, namely a word, and it's such an element in my language because of its pre-existent relations with all other possible words of my language, okay? Whole differential system of units that are uh, differentially related. We got that. But to this structuralist understanding, which highlights how absence and presence operates in respect of signifiers in relationship to one another, we now need to add the additional element of a Hegelian twist. Back to Lee. What Lacan finds in Kojev's reading of Hegel is essentially the claim that the absences that transform symbols into elements of language constitute what are ordinarily thought of as concepts. Whereas Kojev's Hegel clearly takes the concept or word to realize or preserve the vanished empirical past of the thing and thus sees the word concept as constituted by the absence of the past, Lacan grafts onto this reading his essentially structuralist differential view of language. What results then, and this is, this is the point, what results then is a rather complex theory of language, according to which the word is constituted by a double absence, that of the things past and that of the system of language. And that's the part that I'm trying to get us to focus on, that for the Lacanian reading and, and, and reconceptualization of language in function and field, the signifier is constituted by a double absence not just the fact that it's differentially uh, separable from, not separable, but differentially uh, operative in a system of signifiers, but also in relationship to the thing, the thing's past. Back to Lee, going somewhat beyond Kojev's claim that the thing's past is eternally preserved in the word concept, Lacan asserts the fundamental priority of the language or conceptual system, the symbolic to the world of things. And what this means then, it is the nothingness of words, the nothingness of words, or in that respect, the nothingness of signifiers, which engenders things in the first place. And yet now we start to see there's a feature of preservation, of a type of symbolic immortality that comes to play here. So to restate the point, it is words, or more appropriately, perhaps signifiers, that abstract things from their inaccessible singularity of ephemeral temporal existence, providing with the status of firmness and constancy. In other words, what Lacan is building on here is to suggest that there's both word as murder of the thing, but that implies with that also a kind of perpetuation, a kind of immortality. Here's another one of those moments when Paul Bahagi jumps out of temporality and helps us out. This is his quote, the separation with the thing is irrevocable, irrevocably installed by the use of the signifier. The separation between the subject and the other is installed once they speak. The separation means that the desire of the subject is eternalized. The subject will never be able to join the object because the symbol has made that impossible. And here we overlaying once again that Hegelian notion, the symbol first manifests itself as the killing of the thing, and this death results in the endless perpetuation of the subject's desire. And although there's an awful lot more we could say, let's just see, I think it's about time to end here. Uh, I just want to quickly stress that idea. Playing on Hegel's famous phrase, Lacan reminds us that it's the symbol which first manifests itself as the killing of the thing which extends the idea, he extends this idea to stress that this death results in the endless perpetuation of the subject's desire. Um, okay, maybe what we'll do is, yeah, let's, let's stop there. Um, 
couple of areas where we could discuss in questions. It might be interesting to talk about the notion of a conjectural science. I know I'd put that on, on the list of things we might speak about. Um, we could also speak about death drive and how Lacan uses the topological formation of the torus right towards the end. Um, that'd be good if we could do that. But I suppose what I've really wanted to do here is, is try to, to, to conclude is to introduce both a few hopefully kind of accessible ideas, but also some that are far less than accessible, but that I think are kind of important to grasping the role of language, the role of language in the making of the subject and the overlapping of this precipitate temporality of the future through which the subject might be realized and might in fact be shifted and changed within the clinical domain by virtue of this emphasis of the future anterior. And also to stress that the future anterior, that direction of theory, that conceptualization of theory has a kind of overlap and a kind of echo in this notion of the signifierness of language, which itself implies something like a zero um, signifier, a point of location, a kind of emptiness, and an emptiness within language, which also perpetra uh, perpetrates, perpetuates desire by virtue of making up that opening, that lacking. Okay, let me stop there, and then um, hopefully there'll be some questions or thoughts, or indeed, hopefully, clarifications. Derek, thank you so much. It was incredibly clear. We managed to take what well, is a really very challenging text and not only shine a light on it, but actually weave disparate elements of the text together in a way that starts to make sense of it, starts to make a sense of it at least. Um, so um, tons of food for thoughts, tons of questions. Um, I don't want to hog the questions here because we've got a lot of people here um, who I imagine have lots of questions. But I just want to just kind of kick things off. You, you started off at the beginning of your talk talking um, about the idea of temporar temporality, and you end on this idea of the um, the word in, in perpetuity, the word is the murder of the thing, but the word itself then achieving some kind of perpetuity. How does that articulate back to the idea of temporality? Because surely by the time we have the words to constitute the idea of the word as perpetuity, we've already lost the, the pre-linguistic mode, which arguably never existed at all. Yeah, that, that's good. I mean, two questions or two points to be made there, I think, oddly, I mean, we get this in Heidegger, um, and maybe it's easier in Heidegger, okay? You know, the like the notion that once one is rushing towards death, and I'm so sorry, Martin Heidegger, I'm not really a Heideggerian, so I might be doing a crass injustice, but I don't think anyone's going to feel sympathy for you, so sorry. Um, but in my kind of uh, horrific mashup of what I think Heidegger says, um, what's important is that there is an endpoint, okay? That's, that's why death or finitude is so important there. And I think what, what's starting to happen in Lacan is maybe some kind of family resemblance with that concept. And I think that's also why um, the, the zero symbol and the reference point of a final judgment, it's some kind of ending. It's some kind of, um, it's some kind of future finitude, the end point. And for both Lacan in thinking about the future anterior, and in Heidegger, thinking about rushing towards death and, you know, uh, the, the whatever meaning one wants to give life, that endpoint, rather paradoxically, is a condition of possibility for an enlivened futurity, like a, a different relationship to the future. So it's not quite the same thing that you're asking, but there's something about, um, I was talking about perpetuity, but there's something about the ending which makes a future possible, which, which sounds totally counterintuitive. But the other point you make is, is really wonderful because I could have said this right at the beginning. One of the points of insistence, it's a much more basic point that, that Lacan makes throughout Function and Field, is that he feels psychoanalysis has become overly populated with concepts such as unconscious fantasy in the Kleinian object relations mode, um, with ego psychology, with uh, the imaginarization of psychoanalysis, you could say, so much so that clinicians aren't using words, concepts, language, speech, signifiers, so on and so forth. 
So the whole way through the paper, there's an emphasis on you've got to be within language. You've got to be studying this stuff. You've got to be thinking that. And he uses that, that, that concept, the wall of language, to imply, which I think works quite nicely, the wall of language often implies, like any wall does, that there's something behind it. And I think what he's saying is that psychology per se, and many psychoanalysts, think words are an entry point to something more substantial. Um, you know, affects or whatever's behind the words. But of course, he's going to insist that it is language itself that's important and where we should be working and how we should, what we should focus on, materiality of the signifier. But right at the end, he does actually pose the question, well, what comes before words? And um, he says, I, in fact, I got the quote in front of me, what was before speech in the subject? What was prior to the birth of symbols? right at the end of the paper, and it's kind of startling because for the rest of the paper, you kind of get the idea that the discursive game, the discursive rules he set in place is that don't ask that question because it's kind of meaningless in a Lacanian way to think about a pre-symbolic world because it's never pre-symbolic, even if you yourself as the little fresh born creature haven't started using signifiers in any developed way. But he does ask the question and he provides an answer to it. Um, and I'm not going to give it to you right now because it's great. And I'm hoping maybe another question will. But it's got something to do with death. Fantastic. Um, I could keep exploring this with you, which I maybe will do later on. But for now, I'm um, going to open things up to the floor. So first up, we have Hilda. Hi, Hilda. So good to see everyone and so many colleagues. It's wonderful to hear this talk. I was thinking how um, it's so important to get back to the the basic of the importance of language because then we we get engaged in the letter, the topology, etc. And uh, everything is almost already included in the signifier with this radical um, negativity, no? So I have a, a couple of um, questions. Uh, well, one question and one, um, how do you say, provocation maybe. Um, the first is uh, the evo evocation of language that Lacan talks in this um, essay. Is, is it the evocation about um, the absence? That's one question. And the, the other part is, um, what do you make out of your slip, Derek? I love it. The perpetration what do you do uh, with that like uh, the perpetuation of desire versus the perpetration of desire that's um my question thanks that was that was one of them my god there was a whole bunch um <clears throat> which maybe i'd prefer not to analyze because i have a blushing issue and it's terribly embarrassing to blush on on i suppose i could just turn my my um my camera off um the first question, the evocation of language, I mean, in a way, it, it's kind of a basic point, actually, that Lacan makes earlier on. Um, and it's just to say whenever, the, uh, you know, I can't quote it off, off, hand, off the top of my head, but it's basically whenever there's an instance of speech, it implies an interlocutor or it implies the presence or in, in, indeed, you could say it engenders the presence of a prospective listener, um, of someone who hears. And it, it's a nice point because, you know, I, I suppose it's... Uh, it's evident, you know, when one speaks to in some minimal capacity in as much as one is using language and it's comprehensible to oneself or to one other part of oneself, or it brings with it a context of how it may be heard. Um, so I think, you know, in a way that doesn't sound like a very difficult point to grasp, but then how it gets developed is that that dimension of how I might be heard um, starts to bring with it certain reverberations and certain other possibilities for, for what I think I said. And um, what it also means is that maybe the role of the analyst is not to be the partner in dialogue, but to be the person who, in a way, facilitates uh, the how you might be heard that of the big other for the person themselves. Um, and I suppose for me that the next point would then be that that, once that is in in play engenders more by way of lack and desire because, and you know, this is the message that, that keeps on coming up in function and field. And certainly um, when I was working with Mark de Kessel's initial uh, draft of his commentary um, on that paper for, for the next volume of this book, he would make that point again and again, that once the subject speaks, once the subject speaks in a way that instantiates the other, that means that they are 
um, instantiated as a subject of lack of of whose materiality of speech implies a beyondness to what their ego might be. So I don't know if that would be an equivalent to a kind of absence as you're talking about it. I would say it's more about um, the subject being, or the, certainly the neurotic subject being realized as barred, as lacking, as desiring, as inconsistent. And that kind of motor force, that, that, that lackingness, that barredness is, is in a way part of what is engendering the analytical work. Um, and in that sense, you could say that part of the work is to, it, it, as it were, induce more of the desire of the subject and how they are speaking and the desire that they're unable to, um, to adequately respond to or know themselves in terms of. <laughs> Thanks, Hilda. Volker. Hi. Thank you for your great lecture. It was very helpful. Uh, I have a question about uh, later Lacan talks about, uh, which is called Beyond D. Uh, I'm concerned about the relationship between uh, ethical action and language in, in the later Lacan. Uh, do you think? There is a kind of variation in the later Lacan about the uh, relation between language and ethical action or not. Thank you. I'm, I'm not sure, I didn't hear the last part, a relationship in the later Lacan between language when, and- When, yeah, yeah, when he talks about beyond dich, is there any kind of a, a turning back uh, from his uh, previous condition, previous approach toward ethical action? Um, I, I don't know. That's kind of a big question and a rather open-ended question. Um, and it's, it's a difficult one to answer because, you know, having looked at some of the secondary literature to prepare for this, you know, there's some people who say, like Paul Dehagi says, you know, come seminar 10, there's, there's a major change, there's a shift. Um, and, you know, I, I see that, but I also see some kind of continuities and, you know, it, it's kind of, as soon as you start making these, like, where's their shift, where there's some kind of continuity, or the Kenyans all got something different to say about that. Um, so I don't know. I don't know. I, I think the best thing we could do is, is try to find two precise formulations in different parts of Lacan and then see if there's any interesting dissonance um, or, or kind of uh, uh, effect by overlaying them. But at a broad and general level, I, I, I'm not sure. I mean, you know, some people, what I did like, for example, I think I mentioned it already, Mark de Kessel says somewhere that he thinks function and field is still the most provocative and original and um, uh, important Lacanian text, despite all of the, the concepts of, of later Lacan. Um, so that's just one way of saying, Vaghev, I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe someone else has got a, a, a guess. Um, I know there's quite a few Lacanian mega brains with us so hopefully someone else might be able to help thank you Chris? i have another question oh sorry go ahead uh, about uh, uh, lacan talks about the stupidity of the signifier and uh, you talked about the zero signifier what is uh, relationship between the stupidity of the signifier and zero signifier um, well, again, it, it's one of those, those moments where it would help to have a little bit of context about when he's referring to the stupidity of the signifier. Let me say this. One of the reasons I wanted to bring up the zero signifier is because it's, it's a counterintuitive and I think quite perplexing notion initially. Um, and there's two things one can say about it. So I was intrigued by it and, and would be interested to hear um, from other Lacanians you know, who, who know about it, what, what they think about it. But um, I was interested in, in it for two reasons, because one, I was wondering, is this one of the earliest references to something like um, what will subsequently become the master signifier? And maybe because with the master signifier, we have in a nice turn of phrase, Mladen Dola says a positivization of the void, right? Like, so you have something which is a void, but it's very uh, non-substantiality. It's very absence. 
is turned inside out into a kind of positivity, you know, like God or whatever one of these kind of masters signify. So I like that idea, although I think there's, there's something to be done between those two concepts. But the other thing that was helpful for me in trying to think about what the zero signifier might mean is I just love the idea that there's a symbol which is, or a signifier, which is purely symbol, like is absolutely cleansed of contents that, that does not signify in, in a sense. Um, and in that sense, maybe does differ from a master signifier at some level. But nevertheless, what, does, what seems useful to me about it is initially it seems confounding because how do you have a signifier that just signifies the absence of a signif signification, the absence of, of a signified? That sounds confounding, but on the other hand, it also makes sense if you read it not so much as in a relationship to a signified, but in as much as it positions the subject somewhere. And that's why I found Mark de Kessel's reference to, and, and Lacan's reference to the last judgment really instructive. In other words, the idea of the, the zero signifies not so much to be thought in terms of what it signifies, obviously, because it doesn't signify something, but it does locate us to some kind of endpoint, some kind of reference point. And, and in, um, in the later sections of the paper, Lacan does this interesting thing with death drive. And, and I think that location existentially in Heidegger's death, uh, and in some respects, it also, I think, for, for Lacan. So it's more about how it locates the subject rather than its, than its meaning. Um, just one last thing about the stupidity of the signifier. I mean, you could say that's an axiomatic claim despite what I've said about trying to locate it and see the exact context of what Lacan is saying, it makes kind of axiomatic sense for whenever there is a signifier, because a signifier only ever gets its effects of signification in terms of its relationship to other signifiers. And in a way, it's a kind of incarnation of stupidity, at least if we're trying to find how it is fixed to signifiers. It's, it's, it's always got that minimal quality of, of of senselessness, because it's always relating to other signifiers which are relating to other signifiers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Chase, I think you have a question. Yeah. Oh, and Dirk disappeared. There he is. <laughs> okay, Dirk. So I'm, I tried to f warp this into something that made sense. Um, so with the zero signifier bit, I, what kept coming to mind was, I think it's five, seminar five or seven when Lacan talks about Robinson Crusoe, right? And finding my man Friday's footprints in the sand. And, and he keeps effacing them, right? He erases them and then will put something else back on top, right? In, and Lacan talks about this. Is this, I guess when I look at what he's doing in, in function and field, is this anticipatory of something he's going to develop later with the real, right? What happens when you encounter the thing that absolutely refuses symbolization, period, right? That uh, these little ruptures of the real. And how, how does that come back to this zero signifier? Where, yours, yeah. where what you were talking about seemed to be always about things that always actually eventually happened. What happens when you come up against the thing that can't? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And um, I, I think sometimes it can appear that Lacanians are being a bit tiresome when they say, well, Lacan already had the real in function and field. But there are some moments when, when that kind of thing happens. So my response to your question would be to say that it's, it's a great question. And I'd like to deliver a little bit of a response to it, which is, was part of the paper that it didn't fit in. Uh, and it's also a response to Callum's question. So eventually Lacan does respond to that question. What was there before speech? Or what was there prior to the birth of the symbol? And the way he goes about responding to that, I think does bring into play something in connection with the zero symbol and also something in connection with the real. So as I said before, it's surprising that he asks that question given that you know, the text of function and field seems to be suggesting that's not a question we're allowed to, to, to ask because we have been persuaded time and time again or dissuaded from trying to reach behind language for anything more fundamental. Then again, he does pose that question right towards the end of the paper where he has just gone through a section of discussing multiple variations on the theme of death. In other words, being towards death, the death instinct, the notion of a death wish. And death is then the way he, I think, tries to answer a variation of the question that, that you're asking, Chase, and maybe also that Callum was. So death seems to be the thing that lies behind what comes before language or what exceeds language. Although the twist that Lacan adds here is that death, which presumably always in some way exceeds the grasp of language, 
is also that which existence derives all meaning it has from. So he, he's doing a, a move here, which is a bit like what I think that the idea of the zero symbol is supposed to do. Um, he is lo locating something which both stands outside meaning, both stands outside. It doesn't have definitive signifieds. It, it, it contorts, it, it confuses uh, meaning. It stands outside of the grasp of language, but nonetheless is a crucial anchoring point in the fact that language works. So let me recapitulate, let's put that differently. At the very moment that we find an apparent outside of language, some real, in the Lacanian sense, some real which language can never domesticate or adequately symbolize, we're also stumbling upon a point of great symbolic density, a point of generative impossibility from which a variety of attempts at signification proliferate. So let's just put those two together. We have something like death that can never be fully encapsulated, domesticated by language. So it seems to stand outside of language. It seems to exceed the, the, the grasp of the symbolic. But at the same point, by virtue of this apparent ability to exceed language, it represents a point of massive symbolic density because we're always talking about or trying to get to grips with what death might mean. So let's build on that a little bit more. We have that type of generative impossibility. What seems outside of language, death itself, or the limits imposed by mortality is also importantly within language. In fact, is even inherent to it in the sense that it is death which more than anything else confers meaning and prompts attempts at symbolization. We have then a situation in which a condition of impossibility, death as the limit beyond which language cannot reach, is simultaneously also its condition of possibility. It's the limit point against which all meaning might be measured and ascertained. We should stay close to how Lacan formulates things here, though. His wording is quite precise. Not only does he assert, here's the quote, that mortal meaning reveals in speech a center that is outside of language, end of quote, he stresses also that this manifests a structure. And the structure in question, in this right towards the end of the paper, is the torus, the topological form, the donut-shaped thing, the topological form of the torus. And Lacan says, the torus differs from the spatialization of a sphere because it defies any binary opposition of a mutually exclusive inside outside categorization. Now, again, this is back to Lacan 101, the, top, the reference to topology to defy or make more complex an in or out kind of binary sphere shape, which has an inside and an outside. A torus has an inside, which is still an outside. Um, this is an ingenious move. So just to, to say again, he's trying to think about how the outside of language is also an inside of language. And he does so by referring to a torus, which is great because it's a topological move that's happening already in 1953, despite that the more concerted focused reference to topology only happens much, much later. As I said, though, this is an ingenious move. What Lacan does then is he ensures that what had seemed definitively outside of the structure that is, the space in the middle of the donut-shaped formation of the torus, or, by extrapolation, the very externality of language, as represented by death, nonetheless remains as an essential part, an inside of that selfsame structure. Death as apparent externality, which is nonetheless an ultimate reference point of language. Um, so that's, that's a bit of a long-winded way of trying to respond, but that, that's one way of trying to respond. I'd, whether one finds it a convincing response is, is, is up for grabs, I suppose, it's up for debate. But I think it also maybe somehow clarifies why I was so mystified and interested in the, in the zero symbol, because the zero symbol, once again, is something which is a reference point. Um, and that reference point or that outside of the signified is also what in some respects is a condition of possibility for signifiers to carry on working, just in the way that, that the outside of language is also the necessary condition of possibility for language to work. Or we could make another extrapolation that the ontological prioritization of lack is a necessary logical condition of possibility for subjects who think that they are substantialized egos. Um, yeah. Brilliant. Thanks, Derek. Um, Haim, I think you had a question. You disappeared from my screen. Yeah, I'm here. Hi, thank you, uh, Derek. The, the talk was really breathtakingly lucid um, and clear. Um, 
you mentioned uh, the death drive, something you might want to return to. And we're since we're already on the subject, um, how, how do the drives generally um, figure here? Um, and also, when can we read this, uh, this text? Um, well, you can email me and I'll send it to you. But like, that's a nightmare, dude. You really want to? I mean, it's long. It's like it's like 40,000 words um, and it needs a little bit of a correction. Although Callum knows I've been, you know, com symptomatically complaining about it for quite some time. But, you know, just email me. But only you, hey, don't let anyone else know. Um, <clears throat> OK, so where do the drives fit in? I, I don't know. I don't know. I think in a way, um, and it's hard to hold that whole decree in mind. Um, so I may be misspeaking here, but I think in a way, at this point in Lacan, in 1953, there's 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 rather a concerted effort to avoid the topic of something like libido, which would too easily link itself to um, uh, a substantialization or a bodily or an organic component. So I think maybe you could say, I'm guessing here, that there's almost a strategic avoidance of certain Freudian concepts, which might um, mean that Lacan's readers will collapse what he's saying back into a kind of post-Freudian reading that he doesn't want them to get. What is very interesting about drive and death drive in um, Function and Field is that routinely he refers to death instinct. And of course, you know, we all know from the basic critiques of Strachey and Strachey and how he translates Freud that, that this is a mistranslation, that it should be drive, not, not instinct. So, you know, Lacan's obviously fully aware of this, but routinely wants to put those two terms together, death instinct. So why does he do this? One of the reasons I think he does it is to deliberately impress upon us the, the oxymoronic impossibility of this concept, um, to stress that an instinct for death is, is, is like somehow an impossible concept. Um, so that's one thing to say about it. Um, the other thing to say about it though is, and I'm again, much indebted to Mark Kessel who, who did a great footnote. He's, his footnote is the way that, that Lacan starts to talk about death and death drive. And in fact, also talks about it in terms of the topological uh, formation of the Taurus that we spoke about in a little bit, is that there's an interesting coincidence of desire and death drive. And um, I could talk about this at length, so I'll try not to do it now. But Mark de Kessel's insight was that here already, Lacan is anticipating something of Seminar 7. And in Seminar 7, and it, it gets kind of complicated and difficult to, to be precise, but we have this notion of a purified form of desire. The purified form of desire, and I can see Callum's watching me, so now I'm very anxious because he knows Seminar 7 better than me and read a book on ethics and Seminar 7. So um, you see that's the sweat trickling down, pers perspiration. And yet he made a Freudian slip. But anyway, okay, so, but to go back to your question, one way then of thinking what is, um, and it might be a slightly controversial reading, but one way of thinking of what is this purified desire? The desire that Antigone has to go all the way to the end, to, to bury her brother, despite that it will take her beyond the pleasure principle, despite that it'll result in her death, her symbolic death, is that we have here an odd and interesting and indeed ethical conjunction of pure desire and death drive, which means in some respects, you could say that this is desire taken to such a logical, uh, radical extent that you would sacrifice everything for that desire which is also in some ways, presumably a kind of ethical uh, thing. And in so doing, we have, as I've just put it, like an overlap of, of death, drive and desire. You could say in subsequent seminars, maybe it's better understood as that's perhaps no longer even desire in as much as it is pure death drive, although can we even conceptualize pure drive? I don't think so, or pure death drive. But that's what I would say. I would say that that interesting um, conjunction is, is posed it towards the end of function and field. And, it, and it's one point that gets taken up um, what must be eight years later in, in seminar seven. And I've got a great paper on that. So uh, you're gonna email me anyways, right? For this thing. Um, so I can send you that one as well. I hope that helps. Oh, wonderful. Do I have uh, your email? Um, uh, it's not very hard to find. Maybe you I could will, PM me. I will, I'll put it in the chat, yeah. Thanks for your answer.
Yeah, thanks for thanks for the question. Thanks, Ian. thanks, Home, and thanks, Derek. Um, I think we're just after half past nine UK time, um, so I think we've probably got time for one, possibly two more questions. Do we have any more questions? Not seeing any hands, and Kieran, Kieran, go for it. Hi. Thanks so much. That was really great. Uh, although I'm somewhat of a beginner, so I'm not sure I, I got it all. But uh, uh, just a quick comment, really. I was uh, watching a documentary last night, and the guy on it made a very kind of fascinating slip of the tongue, where he said, instead of saying, "When I reach my destination," he said, "When I reach my destiny." And I didn't know why I found it fascinating, but maybe it's something it kind of seemed to map on to at the beginning of your talk when you were speak, speaking about futurity or that thing where, you know, you're, uh, um, the subject is forced to kind of speak and uh, face the other in themselves. So there's something of when you say a sentence that you, you know, you might have a destination in mind, but it kind of ends somewhere else. So I quite liked that idea. And just a quick question about uh, jouissance. I was surprised that you didn't... Uh, mention that word in a way because i hear it so much but when you spoke about uh like saying the subject being cut off from the object by its entrance into language and then that sets the search for this kind of missing signifier in play is that uh, um that's connected to jouissance or that try trying to uh, regain that uh, kind of lost uh, wholeness with the world with the object would that be a uh, um, does that make any sense or? Yeah, I mean, uh, one way to take it up is, um, and I was wondering if Dominique Hones is still here or was here, I'd like to get his take on it as well. Um, the word jouissance does come up in, in function and field. And again, this is one of those moments when it's been a while, so I've got to make sure I'm not misrepresenting things here. But one could appreciate why it might not be given too much uh, uh, exposure here. And I'm referring also to, um, I mean, Darren Leader's got a book coming out on, on the topic of jouissance, and he did a talk um, not so long ago, where he pretty much, I mean, it's, it's a kind of move I've also um, been tempted to make and have made, is that like, there's a weird way in which once jouissance is, start to, is used to do explanatory work, you can then start to ask the question, well, how much explanation does it actually do? It's one of those kind of Lacanian signifiers, which once it takes hold, it ha you, you know, you see it everywhere and, and, it's, and it's implicitly used as an explanatory concept when in, in many respects, it's not really that useful as an explanatory concept unless you utilize it alongside a whole series of adjacent associated and necessarily um, contextualizing other concepts. I mean, it's, it's, it's a broader argument. But um, I think that my way of answering your question is that it's a, it's a pertinent, problematic, and it's a crucial one. But I think what Lacan's overarching agenda in function and field is, is to try and think the multiple different dimensions of the materiality of the signifier, the structures of language, um, and, and language and law, um, all of those, those facets that are important to thinking the, the role of language, speech, speech uh, structures of language, and the live agency, the insistence of the signifier. So given that that's his agenda, uh, and also that it's much uh, uh, relatively early Lacan, I think it's, it's not odd that there's not more on jouissance. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe that's just my short answer. Sorry, I hope, I hope that. Okay, thank you. Thanks again. Brilliant. Thanks, Kieran. Okay, um, Timon, I see your hand up there. We're going to jump to you for the last question. Thank you. What an honour to have the last question. I hope you can hear me well. I had some issues before. I see some people nodding. That's always good. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, it was insightful. I was, was wondering, um, you know, just particular thoughts that, that you can sometimes have in these uh, seminars when, when I heard about gifts and gift giving. Um, it might be a bit of a different question than what we heard before, but it immediately made me think about uh, Jehovah's Witnesses and that they have, from a more Catholic perspective, a bit of a different view on, on gifts. And it made me also think uh, a bit more on um, Lacan, whose brother was a, a, a monk. Um, 
And of course, the other famous concept, the name of the father, which you can also quite easily relate to Catholicism, just made me wonder, like, to what extent, um, yeah, how can we see Lacan's views and, and on, on Catholicism on his, his theories? Like this, this one is the, the Roman document. It's, it, you can also see it as some kind of uh, embracement of, uh, of Rome, the capital of close to the capital of Catholicism. So yeah, to what extent does it play a role? And, and would it maybe pose some challenges on applying these views on non-Catholic populations? Thanks. Yeah, it, it's great. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm looking around like this because I'm looking for my copy of the uh, Rudinesco book where she, she describes some of this. I was surprised because I've heard um, colleagues doing a critique of a more kind of social, historical, ideological sort saying, wow, what's the deal with Lacan's Catholicism? And, you know, I'm, I was kind of a more like, well, it's not about the historical context so much as, you know, how do the ideas enable us to think certain things? But just in a little bit of the contextual historical information that I looked at, for today, precisely around that Rudinesco description of, of Lacan's 500 page document and his in like earnest attempt to, to put himself on the map with this. Um, I mentioned at the beginning that he did try to get an audience with the Pope. And, and as you rightly said, you know, his, his brother was, was a monk and his, he reached out to his brother to try and do that. Um, and it seems that historically there was a very concerted and definite attempt on Lacan's part, however disingenuous or cynical, that, that we're not so sure of, to make some of his ideas palatable precisely to a Catholic or Christian audience. Um, now, where we want to go with that, I mean, that's, an, that's, that's, a, that's a broader project. Um, but I, I was surprised because I wouldn't, you know, often I suppose I would kind of dismiss that stuff or not take it so seriously, but it, it sounds like it was very clear attempt. And Rudinesco's portrayal of it is that it was almost like he was invested in gaining some currency for his ideas, in, in being able to, to get them rooted and taken up. I mean, even within the, the, the Catholic church, right? Um, and interestingly in the United States, for example, I know that some of the early, like um, the Muller and Richardson book, um, I forget which of them, but I mean, there was an engagement with Lacan from, um, from Catholicism, from Catholic intellectuals. Um, so I suppose that's, that's the one point. And um, yeah, it's interesting to ask to what extent was, was that a kind of cynical thing or was it within the parameters of his own religious belief? Although it's hard for me to, to not say, well, you know, Lacan seems to me as a psychoanalyst necessarily an atheist, so I suppose the question then to bounce back off you is um, Lacan, and you see this in function and field a lot, he's utilizing all sorts of philosophical, religious, poetic, um, textual resources, which utterly suits his objective, his agenda of showing symbolic efficacity of how language, of how text, of how literature is informing what it means to even be human, right? Um, so I suppose one, my question is, to what extent is he doing that in a strategic way, drawing on um, theological concepts? Um, but there's also the move, and I think, I think again, Rudinesco makes this, this idea, and, and we see it later in his work as well, um, when he starts talking about, um, God damn it, what is it, like melancholia, that, that in some respects, the world of theology is a richer and more suggestive set of resources for him than is the existing social sciences. Um, he thinks that theologians know more about desire than, than psychologists, for sure. Um, so there's that. But I suppose one also wonders to what extent he uses symbolic materials, existing texts, existing theories, um, with some sense of fidelity or not. And, and my sense would be that he would use them as raw materials, as resources, but not necessarily with any sense of fidelity to Catholicism. Um, but there is, there is a lot of it going on. Um, and, and over years, I mean, I remember years ago, I did a, a, a conference presentation on the Lacanian notion of the subject. And someone said, like, afterwards, I'm not a Lacanian, but like, what you're saying sounds very theological. And I think the person who made the comment was right, actually. It, it, it does sound like there are those, um, those questions and those issues. Anyways, thanks. It was, it was a great question. Not so sure I answered it well, but. A good one to end on, too. Um, thank you, Derek, and thank you all for joining. Thank you for all your wonderful questions. Um, just before you all disappear, um, 
This is our second online event. We're hoping to carry on the online event. We probably will stop at some point over the summer, um, but we hope to at least have one more event before the summer break. So at the end of June, um, we haven't got um, a speaker absolutely nailed down yet. So I'm not going to make any announcement. But if you're not already signed up to um, our mailing list, please go to our website, um, which is um, www.lacanandscotland.com. Sign up to our mailing list. And then as soon as we get um, concrete um, events planned and for future events as well, you'll hear um, what's coming up and you can continue to join us. So thank you for coming along. Please do come back. It's wonderful to have you all here from all over the world um, and spread the word. Let's make it bigger and better next time. Uh, thank you. And thank you very much, Derek. What a wonderful, wonderful talk. Thanks, Callum.